Well, good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to the third series of uh, 39 from 39. 39 minutes of webinar from three members of the planning and environment and property team at 39 Essex Chambers. Uh, my name is Peter Village. Today we have for you a local plan themed discussion. Uh, I will be joined uh, by my colleagues, uh, Rosie Scott and Catherine Barnes. Rosie will be examining lessons to be learned from local plans from the Court of Appeal Heathrow uh, Plan B decision. My colleague, Catherine Barnes, will be discussing recent challenges to local plans brought under Section 113 of the uh, 2004 Act. Uh, I'll be marking the 10th anniversary of at least the start of the demise of regional strategies by asking whether their replacement, the duty to cooperate, is fit for purpose. Each presentation will take about 13 minutes, and at the end there'll be the opportunity for questions, and we really encourage you to uh, ask away. Uh, please make them as general as possible, uh, rather than seeking any specific advice. You'll see a Q and A button at the bottom of your screen, and you may send in your questions at any time during uh, the presentations of the three of us, and we'll come to them later. If you're struggling with the technology, then uh, please also use the Q&A button. And one of our excellent uh, webinar producers, uh, located in the mothership, uh, will try and assist. Uh, the webinar, webinar is now being recorded, so if you miss any part or want to re-watch it, you can catch up from tomorrow when the slides and the recording will be available to see it again. So without uh, any further ado, I'll start my presentation. The 27th of May 2010 uh, marked the demise of regional strategies, the uh, so-called top down approach and it was replaced by the duty to cooperate uh, the bottom up approach of localism uh, which was brought in through the localism act about a year later has the duty to cooperate been a success has it led to faster plan preparation cheaper fewer resources has it been based on rigorous evidence-based decisions it's obviously not top down, it is indeed a bottom up approach, but are the decisions in fact any better? Uh, a little bit of a background, regional spatial strategies were introduced by uh, the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act 2004, which in turn replaced a sub-regional strategy, structure plans from the Town and Country Planning Act 1971 and those sub-regional sub -regional strategies, the structure plans, were uh, examination in public led. In other words, an inspector would uh, determine whether or not they could be approved by the Secretary of State. Regional spatial strategies, as they were then called, were produced by regional planning boards for each of the eight regions in England and the regional planning board itself was approved by the Secretary of State. It was made up of uh, local uh, councillors and other uh, interest, interested bodies. Uh, the EIP of a, an RSS was led by an independent inspector, again, making independent evidence-based judgments, having regards to all the issues uh, in the region. Localism uh, was central to the Tory manifesto to replace the top-down approach. Uh, and it was the notion that local people would decide for themselves how much development to take. And we'll come back to that point later on in this presentation. Uh, and the Right Honourable Eric Pickles, who was then Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government, gave notice of intention to revoke uh, those uh, uh, regional strategies on the 27th of May 2010, 10 years ago today. And, and this is what he said, and I've given you a sort of a, a Dominic Cummings eye test uh, there of what 
he said, but basically he said, I'm going to uh, make a formal announcement about this later, uh, uh, but um, uh, please, please take this as a material planning consideration in any decisions local authorities are taking. And of course that immediately set local planning authorities to throwing their, uh, the preparation of their local plans based on the RSS figures into the bin. Uh, on the 6th of July 2010, the Secretary of State formally revoked regional strategies purportedly under Section 79.6 of the snappily titled Local Democracy, Economic Development and Construction Act 2009. And more confusion and chaos followed uh, following the May announcement as uh, the other local authorities then uh, binned their local plans. Um, and this led one developer, Carla Holmes, uh, to uh, seek a judicial review. Uh, it had purchased a site uh, just outside Winchester, north of Winchester, for 2,000 homes uh, based on uh, an allocation in the southeast plan. And the judicial review was on the grounds that the revocation was contrary to and subverted the policy and objects of the 2009 Act. Uh, and that went before the High Court, Mr. Justice Sales, as he then was, uh, and, and he said this, the main and critical point is that there is no sufficient indication in section 79, subsection six of the 2009 Act, that Parliament intended to reserve to the Secretary of State a power to set that whole elaborate structure at naught, if, in his opinion, it was expedient or necessary to do so because it was not operating in the public interest. If Parliament had intended to create such a power for the Secretary of State, something akin to a Henry VIII clause, since the practical effect of it would be to grant the Secretary of State power to denude primary legislation of any practical effect, without having to seek the approval of Parliament for such a course by passing further legislation. The challenge also succeeded on the failure to undertake a strategic environmental assessment. Uh, the revocation amounted to a plan, program or modification, the adoption of which may have significant environmental effect. Uh, and so Carla eventually succeeded in obtaining uh, planning permission for their 2000 homes, following yet a further challenge by then in the High Court to the Secretary of State's policy and a further successful challenge to the Secretary of State's dismissal of appeal in the teeth of a strong recommendation by an inspectorate inquiry. So uh, the duty to cooperate was brought in through the Localism Act, uh, at which stage, it, obviously, the Secretary of State could achieve his aim of sweeping away regional strategies. And the duty to cooperate is contained in Section 33A, now of the Planning Compulsory Purchase Act 2004. It is a duty cast on all local planning authorities and county councils to engage constructively, actively, and on an ongoing basis in any process by means of which activities within subsection three are undertaken. And activities include the preparation of strategic development plan documents uh, where there's a significant impact on at least two planning areas. How has the duty to cooperate worked in practice? Well, there were a number of early cases, uh, but uh, an early one, which is a good one, is Central Bedfordshire Council and the Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government, a decision of the late uh, Mrs. Justice Frances Patterson. And she said this on a challenge by Central Bedfordshire Council to an inspector's decision that they had failed the duty to cooperate. To come to a planning judgment on a duty to cooperate involves not a mechanistic acceptance of all documents submitted by the plan making authority, but a rigorous examination of those documents and the evidence received, so as to enable an inspector to reach a planning judgment on whether there's been an active and ongoing process of cooperation. The key phrase in my judgment is active and ongoing. By reason of finding there were gaps as the inspector has set out, he was not satisfied that the process had either been active or ongoing. Uh, a later case, uh, St Albans and the Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government, uh, was one where the local authority challenged the inspector's decision 
that it had failed to demonstrate compliance with the duty to cooperate. And it's worth noting that the last time a local plan was adopted in St Albans district was 1994. And it's one of the number of local authorities in the southeast, which are Greenbelt authorities, where there have been significant difficulties in getting plans adopted, either through a failure in the duty to cooperate or for other reasons. And the, exam the inspector examined the approach of the council and found a failure in the duty to cooperate. He focused on the following. Was the engagement constructive? Was the engagement active? Was the engagement ongoing? And was the engagement collaborative? And Mr Justice Ross Cranston held that there was no legal error by the inspector, uh, that the requirement for active and ongoing engagement remained, even where discussions seem to have hit the buffers. So local authorities need to go keep going, even where it's completely obvious that the political will does not exist on either side to find common ground. In practice, uh, I would suggest that the duty to cooperate is highly resource heavy for local planning authorities, not just, of course, those that are preparing their plan, but also for neighboring authorities. A sound plan may depend on cooperative neighboring uh, local planning authorities, because if a, 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 a neighboring local authority is uncooperative, it's also very likely to make the point in due course at the examination that there hasn't been uh, a duty to cooperate or the local authority has failed in other material ways. Uh, this, of course, if there is no duty to cooperate, will lead to serious delay because the inspector will uh, effectively bring the plan pro making process to a halt and effectively uh, the planning authority will have to start again even if it doesn't have to go back to square one in terms of uh, consultation it will uh, certainly have to delay matters for uh, a year or more uh, and the delay to development plan preparation will have of course an economic impact it will lead to uncertainty and it will impact on housing delivery Housing delivery, which at a time, the government reminds us quite rightly, that there is a housing crisis. It was a leap of faith that local politicians would take a preternatural approach in determining local housing requirements for their area, rather than passing the requirement on to a neighbouring local planning authority where it could. And I suggest, therefore, that the duty to cooperate is written water. There is no clear indication to local planning authorities or participants in the plan making process whether the duty has been complied with. No bright line of pass or fail until one gets to the examination and then uh, one finds that the neighbouring planning authority uh, has all sorts of reasons why there has been a failure in uh, the duty to cooperate. So we come to the Hall of Shame, notable development uh, duty to cooperate failures uh, in uh, mostly the southeast, it has to be said. St Albans, uh, number one in 2016, I've already mentioned that in the presentation, which was a challenge eventually to the High Court uh, where they lost. Uh, Wealdon Council in uh, February 2020, another duty to cooperate failure. Seven Oaks in March 2020, another uh, judicial review pending. And in each of these cases, I, I, if you are amused to do so, I urge you to uh, look at the press releases from the leaders of the Council of Wealdon and Seven Oaks, where they come out fighting, fiercely fighting, uh, uh, about the decision. Uh, and certainly won't endear them to uh, any future local plan inspector. And then uh, St Albans, uh, uh, as I say, St Albans number two, uh, again, uh, one really does wonder whether St Albans will ever get a local plan. I rather doubt it. And then, of course, to that, there are many other examples.
of local plan and joint spatial plan soundness failures or significant delays for other reasons. And I can reel off a huge list, but for example, uh, Cambridge and South Cambridge, South Oxfordshire now uh, and West of England JSP. So the plan making process has become an arduous obstacle course. Is it fit for purpose in this post COVID world? Well, the pre-existing housing crisis will be exacerbated through significantly reduced housing delivery. Uh, national economic renewal uh, will be required through house building and development. And that itself will require rapid development plan preparation. Delays in development plan preparation of months and years are simply unacceptable. The truth is, I regret to say, that in my view, the duty to, to cooperate is too time consuming, too expensive, too uncertain, and an onerous barrier to delivery. Localism has become a luxury we can no longer afford, and it is an anchor around the necks of local planning authorities and developers. So I ask, what about an alternative approach? Uh, a sub-regional strategy determined at EIP, evidence-based, free from political uh, interference at a local level, and we could call them sub-regional plans. In conclusion, has the duty to cooperate been a success? Well, you know my answer. Has it led to faster plan preparation? No. Cheaper, fewer resources? No. Has it been based on rigorous uh, evidence-based decisions. The use of the standard methodology of housing requirements itself undermines the entire concept of lo localism because the decision as to quantum is now effectively taken out of the hands of local politicians and is itself a mathematical calculation. So in a sense, one asks, well, what is the point? Uh, and if it is a mathematical calculation, it's one that can be done at a sub-regional level. Uh, and of course, at least that mathematical calculation is evidence-based. That is my presentation. And uh, I'm now going to pass you on to, to Rosie uh, for uh, her next presentation. And I'm trying to... Thank you, Peter, and good morning, everybody. I will now share my screen with you. And we've got a fair amount to get through, so I shall crack on. What I'm discussing today are um, the SEA Directive and Regulations and the lessons with a local plan uh, slant on them from the Heathrow decision, the, the Plan B decision that we got earlier this year. So just the background facts for those of you who may have been uh, worrying about other things at that point. This was a challenge to the Secretary of State's designation of the airport's national policy statement back in June 2018. Uh, and the ANPS favoured a third runway at Heathrow over the Gatwick option. And there was a challenge to that. The challenge was based on the appraisal of sustainability, which the Secretary of State had to carry out before designating um, the ANPS. And that appraisal of sustainability uh, is done under the Planning Act 2008, and it incorporates the requirements of the Strategic Environmental Assessment Directive in the regulations, including the, the requirement to provide an environmental report with the information set out under the regulations, Regulation 12, uh, Article 5, and Annex 1. The hearing in the Divisional Court back in March, the claimants lost, and they won in the Court of Appeal on a single issue on the Paris Agreement. For those of you who don't carry the SEA directive or the regulations in your mind at all times, a brief overview here. Its purpose is to provide a high level of protection for the environment. It's designed to contribute to the integration of environmental considerations at the preparation and adoption stage of plans and programs. So bringing environmental concerns, consideration, evidence into the, uh, the very early stages of creating these strategic level plans and programs. One doesn't just tap the end. You, you have to think about them right from the start. Um, 
they are required for, among other types of plans and programmes, specified types of plans and programmes, such as those concerning town and country planning, land use, and where they set the framework for future development consent, uh, and that is Regulation 5. For local plans, they are required as part of a wider sustainability appraisal under the um, Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act 2004. A sustainability appraisal, as you may know, uh, considers the wider impacts of a plan or programme and takes into account economic and social considerations. Obviously, the SEA uh, element of the sustainability appraisal focuses the mind on the environmental question. Uh, and the SEA process uh, requires that you provide an environmental report which contains the information in Schedule 2 of the regs or Article 5 and Annex 1 of the directive. You must consult on that report. You must consider the results of your consultation uh, and further consultation might be required if you then make changes to your report based on what the consultation said. And then you do a further report on the plan or programme once you've adopted it and then you monitor it. Uh, and in terms of a local plan, the sustainability appraisal is the LPA's responsibility. So looking at the issues that the claimants raised under the SDA regulations and directive, the first one, what is the standard for the court when reviewing an environmental report or a sustainability appraisal uh, under the regs? Now, the divisional court applied the case of Blewett, decided by Mr. Justice Sullivan, as he then was, and they essentially took the standard that he set out on the environmental statement for EIA directive and the regulations and applied it to the SEA directive and regulations. And I set out there in more detail what that standard was. But the starting point is it's for the LPA to decide whether the information is sufficient to meet the definition of the environmental statement in the EIA or your um, environmental report for the SDA regulations. And that is only subject to review under the Wensbury principles. Obviously, information capable of meeting the requirements must be provided. But if it is failed, uh, if that... Uh, a report fails to provide the information, that does not mean that the report fails to qualify altogether uh, as an environmental statement or a report under the SEA regulations, unless the document could not reasonably be described as the document it purports to be. Obviously, if the uh, report is missing certain information, that can, as I've said in brackets there, can lead to the LPA refusing the application, um, but it does not mean that the LPA does not, does not have jurisdiction to even consider the report. Uh, and Blewett set out and the Divisional Court and the Court of Appeal agreed that both the EIA and the SEA process permit defective statements to be cured, as they put it, by publishing and consulting on supplementary material. Now, of course, if an explicitly required matter remains unaddressed, then that is very likely to lead to non-compliance. Uh, but otherwise, we can do it as we go along. Almost it's an iterative process. Uh, and the Court of Appeal said that this is simply a practical application of conventional judicial review principles. We look at the Wensbury principles for review only. So the claimants challenged this and they had a number of heads of challenge. Uh, in the first place, they said the divisional court was wrong. It's not just an evaluative question for the decision maker. And they said this for a number of reasons. You need greater scrutiny to ensure that the information submitted is sufficient for the purposes of the SEA directive which are, uh, as you'll recall, to provide a high level of protection for the environment. Then, considering purposive, uh, purposive interpretation under um, EU law, that means asking whether the environmental report is of sufficient quality to allow for effective comment by those who've been affected by it. And finally, they said the context, the fact that we're looking at this, the SEA directive, which requires a structured review, all of these things mean you need a, a, a greater degree of scrutiny from the court. No, said the Court of Appeal, Article 5 and Annex 1 leave the authority with a wide range of autonomous judgment on the adequacy of the information. Uh, and the LA or the Secretary of State in this case is free to form a reasonable view of its own on the nature and amount of the information required. And anything more is the court substituting its own view and they don't like doing that. And it's not the court's role to adjudicate on the content of the environmental report. The second part of the challenge here was to say that the divisional court understated the Blewett standard uh, and that a fuller picture as possible needs to be provided. No, said the Court of Appeal, uh, it's as full a picture as may reasonably be required, subject to the various issues concerning the information that are set out explicitly in Article 5. For example, the extent to which certain matters are more appropriately assessed at different levels in the decision-making process. 
here at the SEA stage, at the ANPS stage, we're at a national policy level. There are lots and lots of variables going on, lots of other processes that need to be completed. And so it's not appropriate to try and get an absolute granular view um, of, uh, of the information and to assess the information exhaustively. And the court reiterated it's, uh, it's an iterative process. Deficiencies can be overcome during that process so that one ends up with as full a picture as possible. And the third uh, type of challenge, the third leg of their challenge to the standard of review is that the Blewett standard is simply wrong for the SAI directive, said the claimants. Uh, and they said that what you're doing here is you're assessing the environmental effects of the policy itself. And there's no other forum for doing that. So you have to be more rigorous. Whereas under the EIA directive, you're assessing the likely significant environmental effects of a specific individual pro uh, project within a decision making process where you're judging the project against policy. But here you're judging the policy itself. So we need to look at this more carefully. No, said the Court of Appeal, there's no reason to take a more taxing approach to compliance with the SEA directive than with the EIA directive in Blewett. And they set out a number of European and domestic authorities which all agree that the, that the authority must be accorded a substantial area of judgment in relation to compliance. Moving on briskly to issue two, the claimant said that there had been a failure to explain the outline of the relationship between the ANPS with other plans and projects. Uh, and this challenge was based on the fact largely that there had been a cumulative assessment of impacts. And they said that was insufficient. And the fact that individual analysis of the relationship between the ANPS and individual local development plans, the London plan and so on, the fact that that would be complex does not excuse the failure because it's important. No, said the Court of Appeal, Annex 1, Schedule 2 requires an outline of the relationship with other relevant plans and programmes, and this was done. They weren't ignored. The provisions, um, and this is Annex 1, Part 3, uh, Part C, I beg your pardon, the provisions are not unduly onerous. They don't stipulate a particular approach, and they leave a reasonably generous discretion on how to do the work. So the Secretary of State was at liberty to decide how far the analysis should be taken, and you can't challenge his decision not to do it at the level of each local authority. And again, given that we're at a national policy context, cumulative consideration is okay. They did say, as a sort of sop to those who might be a bit concerned about this, that the EIA regime does kick in later down the line when you're looking at a specific application for a development consent order in the context of Heathrow. Um, the SEA assessment does not predetermine the findings of the EIA process for any application that may be made. So we've got another stage of assessment analysis consultation to go through, and the EIA process is separate. The third issue that the claimants raised was that there had been a failure to identify environmental characteristics of the areas that were likely to be significantly affected. And they tried two attacks uh, in this sense. They, they criticized the decision to use indicative flight paths for the Heathrow runway. And they also criticized the threshold adopted for noise assessment. And they said the, the, the threshold adopted was uh, contradicted by the government's own policy. And they uh, argued that it was very important to avoid underestimating the area affected by the Heathrow development because one must apply the precautionary principle. No, said the Court of Appeal, the decision to use indicative flight paths was not irrational given the stage of decision making that we're looking at here. There had been no sighting of the runway, no design yet, and the CAA has charge of the separate airspace change process and that determines flight paths and we haven't had that yet. So the fact that the Secretary of State decided what he did, it was based on expert advice, and in terms of the noise assessment threshold, this was a classic exercise of planning judgment with a substantial margin of appreciation. And the court reiterated that it is not uh, going to determine or arbitrate on squabbles over expert advice. That's a technical matter. That's not for the reviewing role of the court. Issue four, and I'll take this one briefly, uh, the SEA directive required account to be taken of the Paris Agreement. The Secretary of State had been advised that he must not take account of it, so he didn't take account of it. That was misdirection. Uh, the Paris Agreement, um, as uh, comprising government policy on climate change, obviously was relevant to the AMPS, which will have climate change impacts. And to fail to take it into account was clearly, therefore, a breach of the SEA requirement to consider international environmental protection objectives. Even though it's unincorporated, that was sufficient to vitiate the decision. And that is what all the headlines were based on. 
Obviously, the Court of Appeal did not say what the Secretary of State should do about the Paris Agreement or what impact it should have on the decision or on the ANPS. But the fact that there was a, a clear smoking gun in this case, and the government was perfectly frank about it, he had been advised not to take it into account, and so he didn't, and that was unlawful. So what does all this mean for local authorities when you're preparing local plans or other documents requiring SEAs or uh, sustainability appraisals? Now, the difficulty of webinars is I can't hear if you're laughing or not, so I hope that you are, and I'll move on. Sort of. It's sort of freedom. The Court of Appeal was clear that there is a lot of discretion to local authorities to determine the various issues that the claimants were criticising. Uh, and I set out some of these here. Whether the information provided in the SA or your environmental report is sufficient, that's for the local authority. They have a wide range of autonomous judgment, subject to Wensby review. The process is iterative. Uh, and the defects, any defects can be corrected by further assessment, consultation and consideration. The Annex 1, Schedule 2 information requirements are not unduly onerous and they do not stipulate a particular approach and they leave a reasonably generous discretion on how to do the work. The decision maker is at liberty to decide how far the analysis should be taken, again obviously subject to Wensby review. And if when you're making your decisions on how to analyze or what approach to take, if your decision is based on expert evidence, then that is a matter for your decision making um, authority and the court will not arbitrate squabbles about expert evidence. So plenty of discretion for the decision maker available. However, that does not mean that SEAs or uh, sustainability appraisals are toothless tigers. They are absolutely worth the paper they're written on. And moreover, they are not the end of the story. As the Court of Appeal emphasised in several places, more detailed assessments will come on the environmental impact of a particular project in the form of the EIA approach. And as they emphasised, the SEA process does not predetermine what that EIA process will say. So if you're thinking about environmental considerations, don't fail to ask the question at the SEA stage because you don't want the answer, because it will be asked later down the line. So those are my slides. And thank you very much for listening. And I will pass you over to Catherine. Hello, everybody. I'm just going to locate my slides for you. Right, so I'm going to be looking at some recent High Court challenges to local plans to see what the lessons learned are for us practitioners. Uh, and really, I mean lessons learned both for those promoting plans and supporting plans and also for objectors. So I'm going to look at three cases. The first is the CPRE Surrey case, uh, and, and that was a failed challenge. Uh, then the Joplin case, which was a successful challenge. So it seems to me we can pair and contrast those two. And then finally, if there's time, I'll look briefly at the Bond case. So cracking on with CPRE, and I need to tell you a little bit about the background which gave rise to the challenge for you to make sense of it. Back in 2015, three authorities, Waverley, Woking and Guildford, neighbouring authorities, published a joint schmar. So in other words, evidence of housing need across all three areas. In 2016, Waverley then submitted their draft plan for examination. But Woking was quite considerably behind, uh, Woking was considerably behind Waverley in the local plan process. So they um, had not got close to submitting their plan for examination when Waverley did. Following the examination, what the inspector ultimately ended up doing was recommending that Waverley's housing requirement be increased. And he thought that was necessary to address 50% of the unmet housing need in Woking, in other words, one of Waverley's neighbouring areas. Uh, and that was in circumstances where Waverley was the least constrained of the three areas in question. And that then was the subject of CPRE's challenge. They were unhappy with the inspector's recommendation, which obviously increased the housing requirement very significantly and so they launched 
a section 113 challenge. Now, essentially, CPRE's argument was that in making the recommendation to increase the housing requirements, the inspector was relying on out of date evidence of Woking's unmet housing need. And that was because at the time of Waverley's local plan examination, Woking had not yet collected the evidence necessary to determine its housing requirement figure. So in practice, there was little beyond the schmar from 2015. And in a nutshell, the Court of Appeal endorsed the inspector's approach. The court stressed that assessment of housing need is a matter for the decision maker, so the inspector here, and it's a question of planning judgment. So applying the usual principles, unless a decision maker exercises their discretion in an unreasonable way, the court is not going to interfere with the judgment reached. Moreover, it's quite clear that planning policy provides for exactly what the inspector did here, in principle at least. So we all know that it's not uncommon for plans to incorporate unmet need from neighbouring areas. And so the inspector was following policy in that regard. He wasn't going off on a frolic of his own. And it was recognised that the inspector's task was difficult. At the time of the uh, Waverley local plan examination, there was incomplete evidence of Woking's housing need. That evidence hadn't yet been prepared. It wasn't available for the inspector to look at. But the court found that in those circumstances, it was acceptable essentially for the inspector to do the best he could, considering existing evidence, applying policy, taking account of everybody's representations, and then reaching a planning judgment in all of those circumstances. Now, the court also uh, clarified that while the inspector is of course perfectly entitled to request further information and the rules provide for that and of course we also know the inspector could have made a recommendation for an early review neither of those causes of action were actually required just because it was open to the inspector to do them doesn't mean that the inspector had to um, and so the challenge was dismissed and the increased housing requirement um, considered lawful and allowed to remain. So that's the first case. That, if you like, is the failed 113 example for us to look at. Uh, I want to contrast that now. Oh, I, I'm being called by Chambers, I suspect, because I uh, there is some difficulty with me being heard. Um, hello? Oh, I'm sorry, I need to call you back later. Um, I'm sorry about that. I, I'm being told that there's some interference with my microphone and I assume that that was about that. Um, I hope that everybody can hear me. And if not, I assume I'll be told um, otherwise. <laughs> anyway, I'll continue with the Joplin case. So here, the claimant was a campaign group, well, an individual on behalf of a campaign group who um, wanted playing fields in Twickenham to be designated as local green space. Um, the local space was indeed designated initially in the local authorities draft plan. So the campaign group was successful in persuading the local authority that that was appropriate. But at the, at the um, examination, the uh, rejected that designation, um, disagreeing with the local authority and indeed the campaign group. But the main modifications didn't clearly recognise the inspector's um, conclusions in this regard. So when the consultation went ahead on main modifications, the claimant didn't respond to the consultation because the claimant hadn't appreciated that there'd been a change in position. In other words, that 
the playing fields were going to be de-designated on the face of it at least. And indeed, following that consultation, that's exactly what happened in the usual way. The local authority um, accepted the inspector's recommendation, de-designated the fields, and then shortly afterwards, a planning application was made to develop them. So that was the background giving rise to the challenge. You can probably imagine what the claimant argued. It was said that the main modifications didn't make clear what the inspector's recommendation was. In other words, his recommendation to de-designate the playing fields. And had the claimant understood this, they would have responded to the main modifications consultation. And not only would they have responded, but there was substantive further evidence that they would have put in as part of their response. The court ultimately agreed with that argument. The plan was procedurally flawed, or at least this part of the plan, because the main modification consultation was unfair. Because the proposed modifications weren't clear, it was also not clear what was actually being consulted on. It was also the case that the claimant satisfied the substantial prejudice test because they'd been denied the opportunity to make their case on this designation issue. And in the opportunity had arisen, there was evidence that what the claimant had to say could genuinely have made a difference. Uh, and in particular, the claimant referred to various pieces of evidence that it would have liked to have submitted had it known that it needed to. Uh, in particular, evidence of previous use. There was evidence that sporting activities had been going on on these playing fields since um, 1919. And they also had an ecology report which showed a high likelihood of protected species being present on the site. So in all of those circumstances, the challenge was successful. Given that we are short on time, I'm going to skip past the bond case, which is not actually a section 113 challenge, although it's a related high court local plan challenge. You're welcome to read those slides uh, in your free time. Uh, and I'll move on to what I think we can learn from those two cases, our example of a failed 113 challenge and a successful one. The headline point, I think, is that it just stresses how incredibly important it is to participate effectively in a local plan examination if you want to influence the content of a local plan. And by that, I mean, of course, responding to consultations and then participating in the examination itself. Um, it, I'd, we can maybe come on to discuss this in the Q&A if people are interested. In my experience, short and focused representations are by far the most effective way of influencing plans. But, but, but anyway, we can come on to talk about that in more detail if people want. So that's the first thing, really use the local plan examination process to your advantage. If that fails, and of course sometimes it will, it is worth giving serious consideration to a 113 challenge, because as Jopling shows, they do, they can succeed, they do succeed. Uh, and so it's wrong to just assume that it's impossible and that it's not worth pursuing. That said, of course, there needs to be an awareness of the high hurdle that a challenger faces, um, by which I mean the requirement to establish both an error of law and then not only that the error was material, but that the claimant suffered substantial prejudice. You look at the wording of 113, that's the phraseology used. So then what does that mean in practice? If you can identify a procedural error, something like what happened in Jopling, that harmed your client and correction of which could genuinely have made a difference to the plan that ended up being adopted, 
then you may well be in business. Uh, and I'd suggest looking very seriously at section 113. In contrast, what's um, what I think the message from the CPRE case is, is that using section 113 to challenge planning judgment is really, really difficult, even more difficult, I would say, than in a standard judicial review or a standard 288 challenge. So you need to think very carefully about whether section 113 is appropriate, and if so, how best to frame your challenge. Um, so I'll stop there for now, um, for the Q&A, uh, and I'm hoping that Rosie and Peter are going to join me for this to help answer your questions. We've got some of them already in our Q&A box. So most of these questions here appear to be for Peter. There's broad agreement, it seems, about the, the duty to cooperate conclusions and, and the flaws and the issues with that. Um, particular interest in the suggested regional approach and the likelihood of that. Um, yes. Peter, there's, uh, uh, any, any mean, one that you particular? Well, there are lots of questions we've got here, and, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to rely on both of you to help me if you don't mind. But the first one uh, I just want to deal with is relates to St Albans, and and it asks whether, uh, well, it asserts I think that uh, St Albans is heading towards a second failure to meet the duty to cooperate, uh, and um, and given the imperative to deliver homes with a dismal 1.8 year land supply, do I see any scope to mount appeals given the national um, housing crisis? Well, <clears throat> the answer to that, I think, is that, uh, of course, the government have made it clear that they don't uh, see ad hoc uh, uh, releases of Greenbelt through the appeal process uh, based upon the lack of a five-year housing land supply, and that advice still remains. But um, I think to quote uh, the, the importance of being earnest, uh, to have one plan found unsound for failure to, uh, to comply with the duty to cooperate may be regarded as a misfortune to find two plans unsound for the same reason, uh, sounds like carelessness. I think that advice may well apply. And certainly I would uh, look very carefully at uh, running an appeal in St Albans because it's, it's unclear, frankly, as to how uh, St Albans will ever produce a plan given the lack of political will seemingly to, uh, to, to uh, uh, cooperate with neighboring planning authorities. I should just add one further thing about that, and that is, of course, that the Central State has shown and bared his teeth recently in South Oxfordshire, uh, threatening uh, to take over the local plan making process and giving it to the County Council. And that may, of course, occur in St Albans. Any further comments? I, I, Peter, just to follow up on that, I, I recently had a, a look at the South Oxfordshire plan and it, it suited me very well that the Secretary of State was pressing pause and that nobody could do anything about it. And it seemed to me that the letters that South Oxfordshire wrote back saying, hang on a moment, the power that you're purporting to use is when you want someone to progress the plan uh, or rather not because it's unsound. But here we're saying that the plan does not uh, accord with our political objectives. And so we are the ones saying we're going to pause. So you don't have any power to do that. It seems now that they've uh, caved in rather. And I just wonder what you thought about that because it seemed to me right for all sorts of exciting challenges and, and years of litigation, but it seems that South Oxfordshire had backed down. Yeah, I think they have backed down. Uh, and as far as I can see, that plan is now going going ahead. I mean, it, it, there are particular circumstances in South Oxfordshire, obviously, with the change of political control. Mm. Um, but, and I think that plan now is on, from, from as I understand it, is now on, on track to be heard, albeit um, how these plans are going to be heard is probably the subject of another webinar. Um, yes, I, 
There, there is. Uh, there are some other questions that we have got. Do, do, do you want to take any of them, Catherine? Um, well, one question I think I'm being asked, which actually I've been asked a few times in other contexts, so I think it is probably worth answering for everyone, um, is how to secure a seat at a local plan uh, examination if you want to support the local plan. Um, because normally um, the inspector rules will say when they're setting out how the examination will work that you can only attend the various hearings if you're objecting. Um, and I mean, I wonder if um, Rosie and Peter have anything to add to this, but I have certainly seen people, um, I was going to say fabricate, that is not what I mean, um, but, but um, formulate their arguments um, in such a way that they are identifying some aspect of objection within a topic that they're interested in just to get themselves a seat at the table because that is so important. Yes, I, don't really like that. I mean, I think it's, it's simply just uh, uh, the fact that there's probably no aspect of a plan that's perfect and that one can always identify something which allows you to get your feet under the table by way of an objection. And then to assist the uh, inspector in the examination with some observations which relate mm. to the underlying premise behind yeah, I think that's exactly right. And it's just about making sure that you focus your objection within the topic that you're primarily interested in. And um, lots of these questions seem to be for you, Peter, um, about... Well, that's what I was rather troubled about. Um, <laughs> but, um, let's have a quick go through that, because actually I couldn't uh, find, get the thing on my screen, but I've now managed to master that. Um, uh, so... Um, do we think that as a result of the failure to produce a local plan for St Albans due to the political stalemate, this will lead to the local planning authority being brought into special measures? And what do you foresee the implications that this might have? Well, I think if it was brought into special measures, it might actually just result in a local plan for St Albans. But uh, having said that, uh, it, it's very much the last resort. Uh, and I would hope that St Albans will wake up very quickly indeed and, and understand that unless they come forward with a plan which deals with the unmet need in, in uh, neighbouring areas, they will, uh, they will in fact find the Secretary of State setting the plan for them, or, or maybe a, uh, yeah, probably would be the Secretary of State, I think, in St Albans. Um, so I think that deals with uh, St Albans. Um, the, I note at the bottom, Catherine, that somebody has commented on, on the response that you just gave and, and uh, has said that they have secured a seat at the table in support by being invited to take part by the local planning authority, which obviously sounds like the Rolls Royce red carpet treatment and uh, lucky you if you can get it. I, I wonder if that, if that individual could perhaps write a blog post on how one obtains an invitation from a local planning authority to participate. That would be quite, quite helpful. But I think that, that's a slightly different issue because that if you're, if you're, for example, a developer with, say, the most substantial allocation in the plan, the planning authority will want some, some support as to how uh, the site will be developed and so on. So it, it may well be that you, you can get an invitation by the back door through that, through that means. Um, th then I think... Um, uh, someone else asks, well, what's the chances of my suggestion of sub-regional plans being taken up? And I would suggest that I suppose that depends on whether they are sufficiently weird to appeal to Dominic Cummings. Um, uh, now, um, uh, I think... Um, I mean, there, there's Peter, I wonder if maybe you just want to address the point whether you think there is political appetite to deal with this issue. Well, I, I, think, there, I think there probably is, because I think it, it is recognised that uh, there is now a growing evidence of, to support the fact that the duty to cooperate is, is cumbersome and simply is a bar to delivery. 
I mean, there are now many, many examples of local authorities in difficult areas. And, and, and the, 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 the concept of duty to cooperate has got to effectively work for all local authorities, not just those authorities where there isn't the pressure for development, but particularly for the authorities where there is a pressure for development. And for example, where, there's, where they're surrounded by green belt. Um, we should also mention that uh, we are able to export all of your questions along with your email addresses and, and we can sweep up and reply to those that uh, we haven't dealt with now. So just because we haven't managed to answer it now, it doesn't mean it will go unanswered forever. Catherine, are there some points that you want to, uh, any further points you don't want to raise? Um, Um, no, I don't think particularly. And because I'm just looking at the time, we are coming up to an hour, which is, I'll probably get told off by our producer for um, getting over <laughs> our time. So I think perhaps the, the answer is that we can deal with these other points. We haven't answered all the questions um, uh, offline. Uh, but um, all, all I'd like to do now is thank uh, my colleagues and obviously the the hundreds, many hundreds of people who have um, dialed in, as it were, to to listen to this. Thank you very much. Um, unless there's anything else, uh, I'm going to say goodbye. <laughs>